So chapter 17, we're going to be doing plane mo motion of rigid energy and momentum. So energy, this is my favorite way to solve dynamic problems because energy is just a scalar property. You don't have to worry about X, Y, Z components or going up or down. Just the magnitude is all you have to worry about. So given the choice of different methods of solving something, always choose energy as your first choice because this is going to be the easiest one. We'll also look at momentum. So not just linear momentum, but angular momentum as well. So once again, we're going from systems of particles where you would have like the MGH of a tennis ball goes to one half hemi squared to three dimensional objects where different corners of this object have different velocities and will have a rotational energy as well as translational energy associated with these things. So just a few more terms to keep track of with inertia is going to be in a lot of these equations. Here's an example for an application. This is a Sharpie impact test for materials testing. So you load a piece of material down here at the base and you have this very heavy pendulum that you calibrate. So if you let it go and it swings back up, theoretically, if there's no friction then it would swing back up to the same height, there's a little bit of frictional losses. So that's the calibration. You look at where it would swing to just all on its own. And then what you do is you, you put a sample in here just a very small, like one centimeter by one centimeter bar that has a notch in it. That's why it's called a, a notch test. And this pendulum slams into it, breaks the sample, keeps going and swings back up. And you can measure the energy it takes to break that piece of material by how far back up this pendulum swings at the end of it. So very simple MGH to one half mv squared, MGH energy balance problem that is used in industry to classify materials and the energy it takes to break materials. So here we go, work and energy, looking at displacements and velocities. T denotes kinetic energy. U, this is gonna be a combination of both potential energy and work. So any kind of force through a distance. And of course this energy equation, all of this comes from F equals MA, for energy, we're going to worry about displacements rather than time. So to get rid of time, we use that chain rule. We throw dx over dx into here. dx over dt turns into velocity. And we're left with, instead of f equals ma, f equals mv dv dx. Take the dx over. And f dx, f dx turns into, I shouldn't say x or dy or dz. It's just some kind of displacement. S, it could be a, an arc length or something. So any kind of force that will change the velocity, this is a dot product. So if it's friction, the force has to be in the same direction as the motion is the trick for this thing. If your final energy, if your final velocity is larger, that means that work was speeding it up and you have something positive. Or if you're slowing it down, then you have something negative. So remember back to everything you know about work. This could be potential energy. It could be mg. H, MGH, it could be energy from a spring. So if you integrate KX DX, that gives you one half KX squared. So this could be potential energy. This could be work, force from friction. We are going to be adding in a moment. So let's say initially we have some initial rotation. What's going to change? How fast that's rotating? And instead of force through a distance, that will be moment d theta. So you can think of what creates a distance for rotational motion? Circumference equals two pi r or s equals r theta. So that's the neat thing about radians. Remember is it relates the change in an angle to a change in distance. So s equals r theta. So instead of ds, you could have r d theta, f r d theta, moment d theta. So you have a moment changing rotational motion. You have force changing translational motion and you have two pieces to our energy. So translational kinetic energy, one half mv squared, just like we had before. The new piece of this is one half i omega squared. i is the moment of inertia. So you can think of translational velocity for a rotating object, v equals r omega. So if you have v squared, that's r squared omega squared. And if you have mr squared, that's you're getting into inertia terms there. So mr squared, omega squared. So this is the rotational kinetic energy as well as translational kinetic energy. 
and this is going to be changed by applying a force in a moment to your object. So then you'll have some final energy after you've changed it from forces. So a few, few extra terms to keep track of here in this new chapter. Impulse and momentum. So now we have linear momentum, m times v, l, and we have angular momentum, r cross mv. A couple extra terms here too. So this also comes from Newton's F equals MA, only this time A dV dt, we're going to keep that T in there. So grab a dt, pull it over to the side, F dt equals M dV. So here's your linear momentum that has the symbol L. So you have some initial velocity, and if that velocity is going to change, you're going to add any kind of force onto it that changes it, and the impulse part comes through dt. This one is a vector. You can see those little vector signs above it. So you'll be splitting these into x, y, z components. So the velocity in the x direction is changed by the impulse in the x direction. So fx dt, or the velocity in the y direction would be changed by the force in the y direction. So back to vectors and breaking things into x, y, z components for this one. For angular momentum, this is also a vector. Remember, moment is a vector that describes the axis of rotation. So when you draw that straight arrow to describe circular motion, that straight arrow represents the axis of rotation with the right-hand rule, where your thumb is pointing in the direction that it's rotating in. Okay, so here we go for moments. If you remember back from statics to what moments are, moments are equal to R cross MV. Remember, this is... 90 degree angle relationships. We're doing a cross product here. And when you plug this in, so I'm gonna take the dt over. So now instead of a force times dt, it's a moment dt. And this will go into r cross mdv or our angular momentum. r cross mv, very similar to r cross ma. So again, it's a cross product. You're breaking your velocities in x, y, z components. Your position vector here, radius, goes from the axis of rotation, or from the point you're taking the angular momentum around, to the piece of the object you're interested in. So remember the direction of that r, that position vector. Remember velocity <clears throat> for rotational motion, you're looking at that tangential velocity, and that's going to be r omega. This gives you two r's, r squared. And this is going to turn into your moment of inertia. This is a very simple system. It works for um, a hoop or like a tennis ball on a string. If all the mass is located at a specific radius, or that would be the radius of gyration, if that's given in a problem statement. Different objects are going to have different moments of inertia. But this is the basic idea of it, is that you have this inertia times your angular velocity. So instead of meters per second, you have radians per second, angular velocity instead of linear velocity. Okay, so linear momentum, FDT goes to new linear momentum. And then if you slap an R and a cross product in front of those, it's going to turn into angular momentum. So instead of MV, it's going to be I omega, where omega is that angular velocity. And that will be changed by applying a moment to it. So moments change rotational motion. Forces are going to change translational motion. And one more thing that we will do at the very end is impact. So this is coefficient of restitution, looking at starting velocities, ending velocities. The difference for here is if you have a three-dimensional object instead of just a particle, now, different corners of that object have different velocities, so you'll have to really look at the point of impact. So what little corner of that object actually experienced that impact? That's the corner that's going to experience the velocity change. And then for the rest of the object, you're going to have to do kind of some relative motion kinematics calculations to see what the rest of the object is doing. Okay, so that's the overview of all of it. And we'll go through each of these sections individually. So work and energy, I'll have a video for this. Impulse and momentum, I'll have a different video for this. Eccentric impact, we'll have another set of videos for that. But this is an overview of the whole chapter.